So welcome folks, today is January 27th, 2021. It is the second, sorry, the third day of our second unit. And today we are going to have a lesson about unicellular adaptations. This is technically the last standard from unit two. We are going to take our test on Monday, so you all will have the weekend to study over the next couple of days. We will have, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll do some review and we'll introduce one more topic related to microscopy, so microscopes. We've got perfect attendance today, which is excellent. Thank you for joining us, Aina. I'm going to share the link to the Nearpod that we're doing with you so you can join in. Oops, not that, sorry. But you can pay attention to that, that's coming up later. Here's the link. All right, so our objective today is to be able to explain how specific cell adaptations help cells survive in particular environments. The essential question, how do specific adaptations help unicellular organisms to survive? So again, by the end of this lesson, we should be able to answer that question. And I expect that we will. We're gonna introduce five adaptations. I think there are some easy ways to remember what these adaptations are and to you know, file them away and, and uh, kind of memorize them, even though they're odd words. But before we do that, as I mentioned, today's warm up and as well as today's exit ticket, I took questions directly from the test item bank. So these won't be the exact same questions that you all will see on your unit two test or on tests going forward, but they will feel very similar in difficulty and in wording. So I want you all as another extra step towards preparing for these tests to get exposed to these test questions more. The cool thing about our warmups and exit tickets is that there is no limit on the number of times that you can take them. So as long as you take them once, you will get credit for having done them because I don't grade them for accuracy. But as you all are studying over the weekend or let's say two months from now when unit two seems like a distant memory, you can come back and do some of these warmups and exit tickets uh, as further preparation for your EOC exam. And of course, that's our ultimate goal. That's our larger goal uh, to, to earn a three, four or five on that EOC exam. So. I believe that having these warm-up questions structured a little bit with a little bit more difficulty is going to benefit you all um, because it'll just make it it'll make you more comfortable experiencing these these types of questions. All right, so one question that I did want to review from today's warm-up asked: Which organelle and organ system pair are the most similar in function? And we were given four options: A, the nucleus and respiratory system which represents the lungs, B, the cell wall and skeletal system, which represents the bones, C, the plasma membrane and nervous system, which represents the brain and spinal cord, or D, the ribosomes and circulatory system, which represents the heart and blood vessels. So here's what I'm gonna do. Don't answer in the chat, because I'm gonna try this, this, this feature, this 21st century technology, where I can ask an open-ended question here in Nearpod, and you all should be able to answer it there. All right, so thank you to the 16 of you who have joined our Nearpod presentation. You should be getting a question to your computer shortly. As it loads and loads and loads. All right, it should be, should be available to you all now. Thank you, Carolyn and Lance, for answering. And remember, the whole point of doing these Nearpods is so that I can hear from some of you who might not otherwise answer. I'm not always going to share your answer publicly, uh, but I just want to hear from you and, and know if you're kind of picking up on, on these questions, see, and know if you're, you're headed in the right direction. So thank you, Carolyn, Melissa, Sally. Oh, not Sally, Ara Sally. Um, Abigail, Ashley, Lance, thank you. Lisa, Josue, thank you.
Okay, we've got 75% participation. Let's take five more seconds. Give me an answer, Nico and Ashanti and Janelle. Excellent. Uh, so let's see, I'm gonna share Ashley's answer. And Ashley, if you could just quickly come off of mute and explain why you said what you said, I would greatly appreciate it. Ashley, or anybody else who, who agrees with Ashley. Oh, there she is. I said um, I put the skeletal system in the cell wall because the skeletal system protects the organs and the cell wall protects like what's inside the um, the organism, I mean the atom. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Good. So um, you are thinking exactly how I would think, and that is the correct answer. The cell wall in the skeletal system does represent really the best analogy. Um, and we're going to explain that a little bit further, and I'll have a cool image to show you guys as well. But thank you, Ashley. I appreciate it. Loading, loading, loading. And I want to congratulate you all for perfect attendance today. OK. So yes, B was the correct answer. The skeletal system, of course, is your skeleton, your bones. and. The cell wall functions in similar ways. It provides not only protection, like Ashley said, right? Our rib cage and our spine really do protect our most vital organs. Our skull protects our brain. Uh, but it also provides our body with structure, right? Our body is shaped in, in the same shape of our skeleton. It also provides uh, support, which means that it allows us to stand up. So the cell wall of specific, of specific cells, not all cells have a cell wall. But the cell wall of specific cells, like plant cells, provides those cells with structure, support, and protection. And we can see the cell wall here. It kind of looks like a chain link fence, but it is actually a cell wall made out of cellulose. Cellulose. All right. Now, what do you all think are those green things? What are those green things? And I'm not going to ask a question, an open ended question here. I just want somebody to unmute themselves and tell me, what do we think these green things are? If these are plant cells. Chloroplasts. Thank you, Josue. Yeah, these are chloroplasts. Chloroplasts have a special pigment called chlorophyll that gives them a green color, and that allows them to absorb light from the sun and to turn that light into usable energy. All right, well, to turn it into food, really, to turn it into glucose. Cool. So we can see all these different small chloroplasts. Obviously, this is an extremely microscopic image, um, but we can see how thin these plant cells are, uh, but they're all connected, right? Their cell walls are connected to one another. Okay, another warm-up review question. You did have this one in your warm-up, so hopefully you're, you've already got some thoughts. But it says different cells have different structures to give them different functions, i.e. certain types of white blood cells have a lot of lysosomes in order to break down pathogens like bacteria and viruses. Of the following types of cells, which would you expect to have the highest concentration of mitochondria? So let's see. One, one, one second as I type this, type this out. All right, so would you say A, muscle cells, B, skin cells, C, nerve cells, or D, bone cells? The question should be appearing on your screen shortly. Thank you, JT. Thank you, Abigail. Thank you, Lance. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Carolyn.
Thank you, Araceli. Thanks, Josue. Okay, so we've got eight people who have submitted answers, and we've got eight more left. Thanks, Lisa. And several others who all jumped in at once. I couldn't tell. <laughs> Okay, so 10 more seconds to get an answer in. Please, Nico, Dijon, Ashanti, Tayshawn. Oh, if you guys can see my screen, then that means that I should hide student names. Okay, so here's what I wanna do quickly. I'm gonna share Melissa's answer. Melissa, can you tell me why you answered how you did? You said A, muscle cells. Why did you say A? Um, I honestly don't know. I kind of just guessed. Okay. Um, there probably was some thought that went into the guess, but that was an excellent guess. Let's see, who else said A? Uh, Carolyn, can you say, can you share with us why you said A? Um, I picked A because it was the one that made the most sense to me. And why, why do you think it made sense? Tell me more about that. Because it really didn't match with the other answer choices, like with bone and nerve and skin. So it had to be muscle. OK. Let's see. Does anybody else want to share why they may have chosen A or why they didn't choose A? Uh, I chose A because you're using your muscles every day, and it needs the most energy. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, JT. And so what does that have to do with mitochondria? What does energy have to do with mitochondria? Say that one more time, Lisa. Um, I'm just gonna mock. Oh, I'm not saying a word. I think it produces the energy for the cells. Yeah, you're exactly right. So mitochondria's primary role, and thank you to the four of you who teamed up for that answer, uh, Melissa, JT, Carolyn, and Lisa. Uh, mitochondria's primary role within the cell is to produce energy. And JT is 100% correct when he said that our muscle cells are constantly using energy, even when you're not thinking about it. Your heart is, is basically a big muscle. And if your heart stops pumping, pumping, then you're in big trouble. So your heart is in constant need of energy because it's constantly contracting and pumping blood to the rest of your body. Uh, your intestines are surrounded by muscle too. So when you swallow food, you no longer have to think about it. Your body does the rest. It has muscles that line your, what's called your alimentary canal. It's basically your digestive tract. And it helps push the food through so that it doesn't get lodged in. But you don't think about that. You can't control that. Your brain does it automatically. So we've always got a need for um, energy. Our muscles need energy. And that's why muscles have a lot, of, a lot of mitochondria. We can see even in this one muscle cell, obviously this is a very close up microscopic image of one. We can see that these zigzags are mitochondria. So it's packed, it's packed with mitochondria. They're constantly needed to produce energy. All right, so today our conversation will center around unicellular adaptations. So multicellular complex organisms like you and I, and most of the life forms with which we are familiar, have organs and tissues and organ systems that allow us to complete those eight essential life processes. I'm gonna ask an open-ended question about that. What are the eight essential life processes? I'm going to share that to you all now. Actually, I'm going to add something. So 
So what are the eight essential life processes? Hint, hint. Think of our famous trusty acronym. Hopefully, this is taking a while because you all are flipping back into your notes. Let me add some stakes here. Oh, we got an answer. Wonderful. Who said it? Thank you, Dijon. Sternger is 100% correct. Now, to anybody who can give me all eight processes, Sternger is the right acronym, but who the first person who can spell out Sternger, type it out, not spell it out, but who can type out what each letter stands for, I will add five points to your unit one test. I will do that literally right now. So the first person who can answer that in this Nearpod, I will add five points to your unit one test. Ooh, synthesis, transport, excretion, regulation, nutrition, growth and development, respiration and reproduction, wonderful. And we almost had perfect spelling too. Who's that? Abigail, excellent job. All right, I am doing that now, Abigail. Excellent. Congratulations. Okay. So those eight essential life processes for you and I, is they, they are completed by uh, our organs. We've got a brain that allows us to send hormones and, and communicate. Uh, we've got a and we've got intestines that allow us to excrete waste. Okay, we've got lungs that allow us to take in oxygen for respiration. And we can see that all of these organs work together in various organ systems. Here are six of the organ systems that make up the human body. Can you all name them? What is this very first organ system on the left? The skeletal system. Yeah, thank you, Dijon. This is the skeletal system. What about the next one? Nervous system. That's the nervous system. Wonderful, Ashley. Thank you. We can see the brain, the thick spinal cord, which is, of course, encased inside of your spine, and then all of those nerves that shoot out. What's next? This circulatory. One. Wonderful. Thank you, Ashley. This is the circulatory system. Uh, the heart is pumping blood through various veins and arteries. It's going to pump oxygenated blood out. And then deoxygenated blood is going to return to the heart where it can then get oxygenated again. What's next? What is this system? Respiratory. 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 Thank you. Uh, what's this fifth one here? Digestive. Digestive system. And the last one should be pretty simple. Muscular. Muscular system, right. All right, so these systems, of course, they don't work independently. They rely on one another. Of course, sometimes we will refer to the muscular system and the skeletal system as one thing. We call it the musculoskeletal system. Uh, the nervous system is going to send out signals and control all of these other systems. So the nervous system controls how your heart beats. The nervous system controls uh, your swallow and, and how the food is kind of timed when it's carried through your digestive system but the circulatory system is needed to provide oxygen to your brain and it gets that oxygen from your respiratory system, right? So these are all working together to achieve those eight life processes. Unicellular organisms, however, do not have special tissues. They don't have organs. They don't have, certainly don't have organ systems. So they need other adaptations in order to achieve and accomplish these eight essential life processes. Remember, when we're taking notes, which hopefully we are, we should be focused on the words that are highlighted in yellow. 
I know that some of you write down as much as you can and then you go back and highlight. That works perfectly well. In fact, that probably works even better. But at the very least, you should be writing down the words that are highlighted. All right, so we've got, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure this is an artist's rendering of paramecia, which is a special type of unicellular organism. So unicellular organisms are pretty cool, not only because they are literally a life form that consists only of one cell, but also because they are basically remnants of the past. They provide us clues about what life first looked like on planet Earth. Okay. So the first unicellular adaptation we'll discuss is an eye spot. We will discuss five different adaptations today. Uh, so for those of you who are writing in the outline method, hopefully you, you have enough room to write down five. Those of you who are writing your notes in a mind map method, you'll have five different branches today. An eye spot is a photosynthetic protein that detects light and allows the organism to respond appropriately. Oops. So we can see this euglena has an eye spot. It's a very, very small region. It, it has a red coloring. It's just a protein that allows the organism to respond appropriately. Okay. I'm going to ask another open ended question. If an eye spot is a protein, what is its monomer? What is its monomer? Good, I've got four or five answers in so far. Six answers. Eight answers. Excellent. Someone says IDK. But for the most part, we're all on the right track here. Amino acids are the monomer of a protein, right? So we want to always, I'm um, sharing this. Someone said, I don't know, was that? Lance, Lance, we've got to remember our first unit, which is foundational. We learned that proteins are made of amino acids, right? So the amino acid is the building block to make a protein. So this I spot is a protein, which must mean that it's a monomer is an amino acid. Excellent job. All right, we'll go back to the slides now. Eye spots are pretty cool because they allow for a process called phototaxis. I'm not sure why that happened. Give me one second. Now it doesn't want to close the activity. 
Okay, cool. Phototaxis is movement in response to light. Photo, of course, is a prefix meaning light, and taxis is a prefix, I'm sorry, a suffix meaning movement. So phototaxis is movement in response to light. There are two types of phototaxis. There's positive phototaxis. Yeah, I can go back in one second, um, Sally. Positive phototaxis is movement towards light, like plants, for example, moving towards sunlight. And negative phototaxis is movement away from light. For example, roaches that run away when a light is switched on. At West Mech, I'm sure you all are aware that we've got some, some roaches. When I first got to my classroom a few years ago uh, and I turned on the lights, there were like four or five roaches that just scurried all across the floor. And for the first month or two, I was killing a roach or two every morning. So they don't like light. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't fun. Eventually I stopped killing them and I would just like trap them and then release them outside. But that was a lot of work. And I think they eventually came back. All right. Yeah, but positive phototaxis is pretty common. In fact, if you have any plants in your in your home, you, you probably can see these plants kind of eventually moving themselves towards the sunlight, which is why it's a good thing to rotate your plants so that all sides of the plants can get access to sunlight. If you don't do that, then eventually the plant will be so bent towards the light that the leaves on the back side will start to die off. They're not getting enough sunlight. I didn't include it on a slide today, but I might include it on a slide tomorrow. But let's see how well you all are thinking here. If phototaxis is movement in response to light, then what do you think chemotaxis would be? C-H-E-M-O taxis. Phototaxis is movement in response to light, then what is chemo taxes chemicals yeah it's movement in response to chemicals so um, this is actually how sperm cells are able to find egg cells egg cells have a specific chemical scent and the sperm cells move via chemo taxes towards that scent. they can pick up on the chemical and they move towards it. Okay. Let me just do this. The video shows a typical euglenophyte, euglena. Euglena does not have a rigid cell wall, we refer to as a pellicle, so the shape changes as the organism moves. So the light source is to the right of this euglena, so you can see it moving towards the sunlight, or not sunlight, but whatever this light source is. So this is an example of positive phototaxis. The second adaptation that we will introduce is called a pseudopod. And again, we really, really want to start to pay attention to the way that words are formed, the etymology of words. What is their, what is their origin? In this case, we include different. Yeah, good, Sally. Pseudo typically means fake. In this case, we're going to kind of take it to mean temporary, but fake still works. I like fake. Pseudopod, P-O-D, is a suffix meaning foot. 
So pseudopod, pseudopod, I'm sorry, is a fake foot or a temporary foot. A pseudopod is a temporary foot-like projection of the cytoplasm and cell membrane that allows an organism to grab and ingest food. We can see at least three pseudopods, but maybe even as many as seven pseudopods coming out of that uh, organism. And those pseudopods are in search of some type of food. And when they find it, they will encase the food so that the organism can use enzymes to break it down and, and eat it, essentially. So the organism that's in the center is actually going to end up being the food. You can see those two pseudopods on either side of that cell extending further and further, trying to surround it. You can also see all the things that are inside of the cell. Those are organelles, mitochondria, perhaps a nuclei or a nucleus, vacuoles, lysosomes.
see the pseudopod growing out further and further out. You get the gist. Three more. Cilia. It's a funny word. Cilia. Cilia are tiny hair-like structures on a cell's external membrane, so on the outside of the cell, allowing for movement and the ability to sense the environment. So on the left, we can see a very close-up image via an electron microscope of cilia. They look like something you might see on the bottom of the ocean floor. Um, but they, they're able to move, um, and in doing so, they help the organism to move through its liquid environment. In the right image, in the image on the right, you can see that they look kind of like whiskers, um, and, and the analogy, the comparison to whiskers is also appropriate because uh, whiskers kind of help some, some animal species to detect things about their environment. Same thing applies to cilia. They, it, helps the, it helps the organism to sense its environment. How warm is it? How acidic is it? What's the pH? How much salt is present? Is there potentially some prey near? Good point, Josue. I've never been a big cat guy myself, I'm more of a dog person, but hopefully I didn't offend any cat owners. I got two cats, and I don't even like cats. <laughs> so I'll just assume it's they, they belong to somebody I'm else. More than than what I'm actually cool with. <laughs> the other one's a jerk. Okay, if you need me to go back, I will, but I think that should have been enough time. <clears throat> uh, another adaptation that's involved in helping the organism to move is called a flagellum. That's the singular version of the word. Plural is called a flagella. But these are whip-like structures that help to propel a cell through its liquid environment. Some organisms have multiple flagella, and some cells have only one flagellum. For example, the sperm cell. All sperm cells, if they're healthy sperm cells, have uh, one flagellum, and it helps them to move towards the egg. That organism on the left has, looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight flagella.
Okay, so quick comparison between cilia and flagella. They do are they are both involved in movement, like I've said. Cilia will appear all across the cell's body. And also it's important to note that the images that we're seeing and even the videos that we've watched obviously are 2D, but we've got to keep in mind that these are 3D structures. They're very, very small, but they're still 3D. All right, so the cilia would appear all across um, the external surface of the cell or of the organism. Um, flagella typically are only going to come out of one portion of the organism. Sometimes you will see them on opposite ends to give the, the cell some directionality of movement, but oftentimes they, you might only see one flagellum or all of the flagella are going to be angled in one specific direction. One more video. Actually, I think two more videos. So this is the process of fertilization. You can see those flagella propelling the sperm cells. Now this is also demonstrating what I said is chemotaxis. So they are sensing in their environment uh, where the egg cell is. Once one sperm cell is able to embed itself into the egg cell, that egg cell is going to actually create its own protein covering that will prevent other sperm cells from entering. When, when two sperm cells uh, are able to penetrate the same egg, which, you're, which you end up with is identical twins. <laughs> yeah, origin story. <laughs> We'll look more, we'll talk more about fertilization later in the unit, later in the course, I'm sorry. And then the last one, the fifth of our unicellular adaptations is called a contractile vacuole. This is a very special type of vac vacuole um, that is specifically going to expand and then contract in order to take in water as it expands and then to expel water or to pump water out as it contracts. It does this in order to main, maintain a specific pressure in the cell or also to help propel the cell in its liquid environment. All right, last video. So you can see this cell has at least two contractile vacuoles. You can see it's expanding, it's taking in water and then it expels water.
All right, you all get the gist. I think we can go ahead and skip past this. These next few slides, no. All right, so we've got a lot to do. The green assignments have been assigned over the previous two days, but I know the previous two days have been a little jumbled. So I just wanted to remind you that those assignments are there. The assignments that are highlighted in yellow are new from today. So the exit ticket, as well as two more asynchronous assignments. It may seem like a lot, but what you'll find is that not only are most of these assignments shorter, but they are also uh, basically the last assignments that we'll have from this unit. So as I said, test day is Monday, which means all of these assignments will be due on Monday. Between now and then, we're only gonna introduce one more assignment tomorrow. So you'll have the entire weekend as well as Friday's asynchronous portion of class to cover these assignments and make sure you get them done. Uh, I have revamped a couple of them so that they include some more difficult questions that are gonna mirror the type of question you all will see on the test on Monday. So I think you'll feel better prepared because of that. That being said, we've got 15 minutes. Um, you see that there's, or there are a number of assignments that you can knock out. Um, and I will leave you to it. I'll be here on mute if you have any questions.
Okay, folks, so thank you all for working hard today and, and contributing. We're gonna stick with this Nearpod model going forward so that I can continue to gauge your voices. It's now 1.20, so you've got 10 minutes before fourth block. Um, go ahead and enjoy that 10 minute break or do whatever you need to do to prepare and I will talk to you all tomorrow. Have a nice day. Thank you, Lance.